Welcome to another episode of Tactical Timeout. Today, we will be diving into the Tau Codex, strategies and combos that have allowed them to be the most dominant army in the last month. Join Justin and Anthony today as they break down some of the most powerful tactics in the game right now. This is Tactical Timeout. Hi there. Welcome to Tactical Timeout. I'm Northern Knight Justin. I'm Northern Knight Anthony. Today we'll be talking about the wonderful world of Tau. We'll watch them in their natural habitat, tell you what's the good and the bad, and how you can destroy your opponent in a game of Warhammer 40,000. So, what's, on the, what's first on the menu? I'm gonna say SWAT teams, because it's just fun as hell. SWAT teams. So, basically the idea is, you take breachers and double fish, just a ton of both. Since you could take one transport for each infantry you take, just every breacher team should have a devil fish transport with them. You get a really good gun, you get a lot of movement. The devil fish is 14 inches. If you do Montka, you could advance for free, so up to 20. There's also a stratagem that lets you disembark after moving. Wow. So legit, you're telling me, by turn one, these guys are already at the front of my doorstep. Boom, boom, crash, right into my door. And I have 10 breachers just marching in there, ready to swat whatever I need to be like killed. Yeah, strength six, AP two, it's just great. I'll tell you this, I've fought that before. I'm playing Admech, first turn, I have four devil fish right in my face. Well, three, but one of them is just capping the back. My entire front line is, takes a lot of damage. I go down from a 20-man ranger squad down to like five models. I lose five of the Cerberus Raiders, and then I lose a lot more of my infiltrators. These things are amazing. Yeah, and if you get countercharged, they have pistols, they have a stratagem to get, make their main gun pistol too. So it's basically two really good shots and free strength five shots. The stratagem I want to bring up is called onboard sensors. You select one devil fish that's within 24 inches of a visible enemy model or a unit. Anything that's within six inches of that devil fish targeting that same unit that was chosen gets to reroll hit rolls of one. Now imagine that you pop Manka, you're already in the face of your enemy. You have one or two squads of breachers already out on the field. Now they get not only reroll wound rolls of one because of Manka, but because of the stratagem, they get to reroll hit rolls of one. And to make it even more greasy, Let's talk about breaching clear. For another CP, you get to select one breacher squad. That breacher squad could ignore all benefits of cover and also reroll all wound rolls. So for that one turn, you get a full reroll of wounds, like super Monka basically. Yeah, even if you don't have use breach and clear, you still get to reroll wound rolls of one in Monka. So you just have this mobile unit with like a 35 inch threat range that can just kill almost any infantry unit right away. And you thought Alpha Strike in ninth edition was dead. This is it. This is new Alpha Strike. This is Fish of Fury. It's coming back, baby. Not to mention, your Devil Fish. They're not done yet. After they're done with unloading their load, they have a fly keyword. If they want to charge something that is in line of sight, that's close, that's a ranged unit, that's vulnerable, it can fly. Yes, it can fly now. It'll fly over enemy models and hit that unit and tag it in combat. Now that ranged unit that you have, that 300 point model that has lots of guns, it can't shoot now. It's in combat. Just remember, you can't fly over the terrain when charging. Yes, you can only fly over models. You cannot fly over terrain. And you must end your movement not on top of any model or any models. And if you're playing Talcept, you could bring the uh, range up to nine inches for the benefit. If you thought Justin's bunker was bad, wait till you hear about this offensive bunker that the Talcept could do. Wait, an offensive bunker? Yeah, it's super shooty, super killy. But the whole point of bunker is it's protecting itself. It's pro <laughs> the best defense is a good offense. True, Monka. Oh, you're going Kuyan with this. Oh, Kuyan, okay. You take a Shadow Sun who lets people within a 12 inch aura since she gets a six inch naturally to her aura, three inches from the command drone and three inches from the Tau set, so 12 inches, a rerolling once to hit for core models since broadsides have core. And you bring an ethereal with you 
to give the broadsides a five plus uh, feel no pain. Shadow Sun and her aura is so big, you could just hide her and, broad and just benefit everybody. So you could just shoot whatever you need to off the table in any area. I cannot believe that they have that much support. These things are amazing already and you're just bringing them up to a whole nother level. I can see why so many tournament players love bringing broadsides. Oh, they're spammed so much. Uh, look at any tournament list, you'll almost guaranteed see broadsides and the next best unit, crisis suits. Oh, don't get me started on the crisis suits, please. I've already, I think I've already had enough suits for one day, but please go on. We have to go on with them because they're very cheap, very points efficient, very mobile, and they could take a decent hit. They also have a great stratagem when you drop in, if you're farsight, reroll all hits and wounds, uh, drop sight clear, or just the normal Tau one since they have a redundant stratagem of drop sight acquisition where you could reroll ones to hit and ones to wound when you come in from Manta Strike, their equivalent of Deep Strike. I'd say that if you are taking Farsight Enclave, it's not really a dumbed down one, but you get to use it almost twice. We roll hits, roll, wound rolls of one for another unit, and then the killer squad, the one that really wants something dead, we roll everything. It's a bit expensive though, two CP each, four CP total, right? Unfortunately, you can't take an ethereal, my friend. You are Farsight Enclaves, you hate the ethereals. You want all the ethereals to be somewhere else. Yeah, unless it's but, Crusade where you take them in the allied uh, worlds. Because GW knows how to write rules. But of course, we don't talk about Farsight allying with ethereals. If you're playing Crusade, don't do that. Play narratively. The reason you take uh, Crisis Suits is they're very points efficient. They have three hard points, so you could take an anti-elite, anti-heavy, and anti-infantry gun if you want, or specialize because they have multiple anti-heavy things, and you only pay extra if you take multiple of the same gun. You could take a cheap squad, no shield drones, no extra drones, just so they take as small of a footprint as possible, and you could deep strike them in a small corner that they didn't uh, screen very well. I know for sure in my future games against Tau, I am going to be screening a lot. Probably bring a lot of infiltrators, bring a lot of deep strike denial. But unfortunately, the crisis will come. The end game crisis will be there waiting for you. Tau are the end game crisis. <laughs> if you want to protect your characters, crisis teams are also very good since you could double up on them with crisis bodyguards. Now, crisis bodyguards, they have a three inch, I'm not going to say aura because that's going to start an argument that uh, they just, characters can't be targeted in there. So you could do something cool and we have the props for it. You put the Crisis Bodyguards behind cover where they can't be seen and the character out in the open. Mm -hmm. You can't target that character now at all. Not with snipers, not with anything. He's just protected, doing whatever he wants. I probably should have used that in the meta, in the bat rep when I had the Cold Star all the way out on the left side. My mistake. I'm thankful you don't use that because that is a very good idea. And we have to mention that a lot of armies do have this strategy but you're not putting a large model like that out in the open with lots of shooting. I can do that with my Space Marine Commander and my Command Squad, but he's not going to get enough traction like this big guy here. And before somebody brings it up, GW have already nerfed it where you cannot bodyguard long strike the vehicle. So you're no more hitting on twos with a railhead you can't target. Don't try that. Kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> that hammerhead is there, but it is not as cheesy as you think. What do you think of a vehicle that can do engage on all front easily and buff units. I'd say that's a very rare to find in this edition, but please wow me. The Tau have something called the Tetra, where they get marker lights on it, and it has a very high movement. It's a Forge World unit, so if you want a replacement, you could use a Piranha, but it's 20 more points. The Tetra is great for engaging all fronts since it's a vehicle, counts right away, and you can marker light stuff around the corner since they're so mobile, buffing the rest of your troops, letting them hit on threes usually. Mm. That's pretty good. And yeah, you're right. You can also use it, for example, if your opponent's hiding really well, just use it as a screening unit. Say you have, you're fighting a really aggressive army, you end up getting turn one and you don't want to risk everything getting you know, charged at hell. Use it as a screening unit. It's a 40 point model, cheap. You use it to move block, use it to you know, bait your opponent to come in. And then if they die, they die. If he dies, he dies. Even though after you finish Knock Moon data and your opponent decides to let them live for some weird reason, they have some pretty good guns. Don't let all the other additions fool you that they're garbage because now they're really strong. And they're also pretty cheap. Yeah, 18 inch strength, five AP minus three, two damage guns. That's not something to laugh at. Even if they're hitting on fours, 
it's still a threat in your opponent's like deployment zone. It's a good amount of shots, and again, they're cheap. They, if they kill anything, they practically get their points back. Yeah, they already made up the points from doing Nakamun data in one corner, but now they get a lot of shooting, and the melee is also pretty decent. And if they don't die, they have really yeah, they have really good movement. 14 inches. They're a jet bike. Yep. Might as well do if your opponent leaves it alone. Do Nakamun in the next table quarter. And the next one. And the next one. The whole world is your oyster for you to do Nakamun. The world is your data. Okay, that works too. If you're wondering about prototype systems, I don't think any are that good to take. There are small improvements to the weapons you already have that are already undercosted. So do you really want to spend like 30 points for a small upgrade? or something useless like the stim injector, which is one turn, four plus feel no pain after you get hurt. Yeah, we hear from Anthony here that prototype systems suck, but if you can think of a set that works with it and a combo that works with any of these prototype systems, please let us know so we can prove Anthony here wrong. I don't think they're bad. They're just, there's better options in the codex. Prove him wrong. Prove him wrong. I'm always right. Ignore everything I've done other videos. Finally, at the thing that everybody was scared of, the railhead, the hammerhead. Just this scary gun that can do a lot of damage. Oh my god, it's so OP. But here's the thing, it's kind of a glass cannon, and you would know this if you saw what I said on the meta show. Sure, it has a lot of movement, sure it has a strong gun, but it's toughness 7, it's pretty easy to tie up, and one shot has a good chance of missing, a good chance of not wounding, especially if you face uh, something with transhuman, marines, mm -hmm. custodies, I think you gene stealers could also have a scuff transhuman. So that improves your odds of not wounding even more, which again, can make the one shot kind of not worth it. It's 145 points. Two, rail, uh, two broadsides do the same thing for the same points, but they have four shots, and they can do potentially more damage with all the same buffs. While he's talking about the railheads, he's right about that. Railheads are 145 points a piece, I believe. If yep. you want to give him upgrades, it's like five point increments extra. But they're hitting on four space, marker light becomes threes, and you get a free reroll with it of that shot. If your opponent is smart enough and gets a lot of dense cover, that becomes a five up or four up with the marker light. If your opponent's really smart and gets out of marker light range, you're hitting on a five up rerollable, which is equivalent to, I'd say, a four plus to hit. Pretty much. So you have a four plus to hit, and you're going to be wounding on twos, which is fine. But another thing you want to think about with target prioritization is Try to not target something that will end up having something that's similar to transhuman. If, for example, you stack on all these debuffs, you're hitting on fours or fives, we have to reroll, and then you're shooting at something that needs a, a four to wound. You basically reduced your chance of killing something drastically. And this is a 145 point model, and you can only shoot it once per turn. And even if you're farsight where you can reroll the wound roll, it's still a decent chance of not wounding. Like take broadsides where two of them cost about the same as one railhead, and that's four shots instead of one. And you still get to reroll once to hit because they're core. You can still make them hit on three because of marker lights. They're still probably wounding on twos or threes. And if you're, you could get a ways to reroll wound rolls. They're just better. That's why you see all the lists taking a bunch of broadsides and not railheads. So if you do have, if you're taking the Tau set and you take Commander Longstrike, that's a railhead that I would recommend you take. Yeah, hitting, hitting on twos. On, hitting on twos with, with marker, marker lights. lights. Threes if you don't have marker lights. And you still have the reroll. And I believe it's plus one to wound against vehicles. But I mean, you don't really need that considering you're basically wounding everything in the game on twos. So we all know Tau are probably getting a nerf. Like the writing's on the wall. There's not a chance they could have this like 65% win rate and keep that. So the, a nerf is bound to come in. So we have some replacement units for when that happens. Now that we finished talking about our lovable hammerhead gunship. Let's see what'll happen when the new update FAQs and data slate comes out. Maybe the hammerhead will get a little bit more time in the sun because the bright crisis suits and broadsides might take a little bit of a tweak. But I wanna talk about my new favorite unit, the scabber gunship, the sister to the hammerhead gunship. This model comes with the seeker missile rack, D3 shots plus one, strength nine, AP minus three, two D3 damage. It's 135 points, so it's 10 points cheaper than the Hammerhead, and it comes with two marker lights included. You get a lot of bang for your buck here for 135 points. It also comes with the standard rule from the Hammerhead of rerolling one hit roll, and it also includes something that allows it to hit aircraft on an improved ballistic skill of two, and also does rerolling the damage against aircraft. So a lot of armies bring aircraft, usually like orcs and admech, like one or two aircraft. So this thing will prove to be scary for them. Like, it's overall just a very versatile unit. 
The plus two might sound like it's useless what, with hit rolls only being able to be modified by one up or down, but it basically lets you ignore a minus one to hit. So it's still really good to have and it's a free include on a good unit that I think people are sleeping on. Yeah, you heard it first folks. Northern Knights Gaming says Skyrim gunships are good. Not only are they good, they're gonna be uh, what people take after a bunch of nerfs. Make sure you clip this. <laughs> if you want a better idea for the numbers of the Skyray, one shot from the railhead could do 10 to 12 damage, three of them being mortal wounds. The Skyray, one shot could do 2d3, so potentially six. It's two to six damage, but it has four shots. And if you're going tie on with Shadow Sun nearby, so all the buffs and fours exploding, that's potentially like 30, 24 damage easy, maybe 36, potentially more if you get really lucky. Still, like 24 damage easy is a lot that not much could stand up to. Yep, you just, you're going with the old fashioned way of you overload your opponent's defenses, something's gonna give in. Most models in this game have a four plus invuln save, and if you shoot four shots at it, two shots are gonna land and they're gonna suffer 2d3 damage. So six damage usually in one turn. A lot more reliable, I find, than the Hammerhead, but of course, we'll still love our Hammerheads. It's one great shot, but there's a reason you don't really see it in tournaments and you see broadsides. Now, we want to throw in one really fun tactic here that I really like doing. And you actually saw it in the battle report. A Cold Star with the Relic, the Gauntlet. I remember this. It's the guy who died on turn one, right? <laughs> if he survived, he would have done a lot. Don't blame the strategy, blame the player. But he's still the guy who died, right? He's still the guy who died turn one. Cold Star is great, 14 inch movement, strength five gun with 10 shots, AP one. So you can just wipe out infantry. You have the Warlord trait that lets you reroll all hits, all wounds. You have the gauntlet that you can just beat someone like it's Iron Man beating the Hulk. Still love that scene. And just, you can wipe out infantry like it's nothing, charge them, kill vehicles. As long as you don't get him killed turn one like I did. So, because you never, got, you, got, you never even got to see action, we can say it indeed is a prototype. And I doubt it'll ever get out of the prototype stage. No, because you never saw him in action, you have no proof that it's not great. Because it's the player's fault there, not the strategy. Perfect strategy, I swear. Schrodinger's fish. We don't know if it's good or not until we open it up and see what it can do. <laughs> I expect you, though, to put that model back into good use because it does sound like an interesting tactic. I'm going to use him every game just for fun. And I expect him to die turn one every single turn just to make sure I don't see that happen. It's only happened twice. You don't have to hear about the second time. We, don't, we also don't talk about the one time that it works. Thank you for joining us on Tactical Timeout. I hope you enjoyed all the tactics that we have shown you today. Please let us know in the comments of which tactics you like to see, and also share with us some tactics that you have come up with yourself. And don't forget to like and subscribe to Northern Knights Gaming. See you next time.